Part 6, Chapter 3 of Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett, 1861 to 1946. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 6, Chapter 3 He hurried to Svidrigailov's. What he had to hope from that man he did not know. But that man had some hidden power over him. Having once recognized this, he could not rest, and now the time had come. On the way, one question particularly worried him. Had Svidrigailov been to Porfiry's? As far as he could judge, he would swear to it that he had not. He pondered again and again, went over Porfiry's visit. No, he hadn't been, of course he hadn't. But if he had not been yet, would he go? Meanwhile, for the present, he fancied he couldn't. Why? He could not have explained, but if he could, he would not have wasted much thought over it at the moment. It all worried him and at the same time he could not attend to it. Strange to say, none would have believed it, perhaps, but he only felt a faint vague anxiety about his immediate future. Another much more important anxiety tormented him. It concerned himself, but in a different, more vital way. Moreover, he was conscious of immense moral fatigue, though his mind was working better that morning than it had done of late. And was it worth while, after all that had happened, to contend with these new, trivial difficulties? Was it worth while, for instance, to maneuver that Svidrigailov should not go to Porfiry's? Was it worth while to investigate, to ascertain the facts, to waste time over anyone like Svidrigailov? Oh, how sick he was of it all! And yet he was hastening to Svidrigailov. Could he be expecting something new from him, information or means of escape? Men will catch at straws. Was it destiny or some instinct bringing them together? Perhaps it was only fatigue, despair. Perhaps it was not Svidrigailov, but some other whom he needed, and Svidrigailov had simply presented himself by chance. Sonia? But what should he go to Sonia for now? to beg her tears again? He was afraid of Sonia, too. Sonia stood before him as an irrevocable sentence. He must go his own way or hers. At that moment especially he did not feel equal to seeing her. No, would it not be better to try Svidrigailov? And he could not help inwardly owning that he had long felt that he must see him for some reason. But what could they have in common? Their very evil-doing could not be of the same kind. The man, moreover, was very unpleasant, evidently depraved, undoubtedly cunning and deceitful, possibly malignant. Such stories were told about him. It is true he was befriending Katerina Ivanovna's children, but who could tell with what motive and what it meant? The man always had some design, some project. There was another thought which had been continually hovering of late about Raskolnikov's mind, and causing him great uneasiness. It was so painful that he made distinct efforts to get rid of it. He sometimes thought that Svidrigailov was dogging his footsteps. Svidrigailov had found out his secret and had had designs on Donya. What if he had them still? Wasn't it practically certain that he had? And what if, having learnt his secret and so having gained power over him, he were to use it as a weapon against Donya? This idea sometimes even tormented his dreams but it had never presented itself so vividly to him as on his way to Svidrigailov. The very thought moved him to gloomy rage. To begin with, this would transform everything, even his own position. He would have at once to confess his secret to Donya. Would he have to give himself up, perhaps, to prevent Donya from taking some rash step? The letter? This morning Donya had received a letter. From whom could she get letters in Petersburg? Lusion, perhaps? It's true Razumian was there to protect her, but Razumian knew nothing of the position. Perhaps it was his duty to tell Razumian. He thought of it with repugnance. In any case, he must see Svidrigailov as soon as possible, he decided finally. Thank God the details of the interview were of little consequence, if only he could get at the root of the matter. But if Svidrigailov were capable, if he were intriguing against Donya, then... 
Raskolnikov was so exhausted by what he had passed through that month that he could only decide such questions in one way. Then I shall kill him, he thought in cold despair. A sudden anguish oppressed his heart. He stood in the middle of the street and began looking about to see where he was and which way he was going. He found himself in X Prospect, thirty or forty paces from the haymarket, through which he had come. The whole second story of the house on the left was used as a tavern. All the windows were wide open. Judging from the figures moving at the windows, the rooms were full to overflowing. There were sounds of singing, of clarinet and violin, and the boom of a Turkish drum. He could hear women shrieking. He was about to turn back, wondering why he had come to the ex-prospect, when suddenly at one of the end windows he saw Svidrigailov, sitting at a tea-table right in the open window with a pipe in his mouth. Raskolnikov was dreadfully taken aback, almost terrified. Svidrigailov was silently watching and scrutinizing him, and, what struck Raskolnikov at once, seemed to be meaning to get up and slipped away unobserved. Raskolnikov at once pretended not to have seen him, but to be looking absent-mindedly away, while he watched him out of the corner of his eye. His heart was beating violently. Yet it was evident that Svidrigailov did not want to be seen. He took the pipe out of his mouth and was on the point of concealing himself, but as he got up and moved back his chair, he seemed to have become suddenly aware that Raskolnikov had seen him, and was watching him. What had passed between them was much the same as what happened at their first meeting in Raskolnikov's room. A sly smile came to Svidrigailov's face, and grew broader and broader. Each knew that he was seen and watched by the other. At last Svidrigailov broke into a loud laugh. "'Well, well, come in if you want me. I am here!' he shouted from the window. Raskolnikov went up into the tavern. He found Svidrigailov in a tiny back room, adjoining the saloon in which merchants, clerks, and numbers of people of all sorts were drinking tea at twenty little tables to the desperate bawling of a chorus of singers. The click of billiard balls could be heard in the distance. On the table before Svidrigailov stood an open bottle and a glass half full of champagne. In the room he found also a boy with a little hand organ, a healthy-looking red-cheeked girl of eighteen, wearing a tucked-up, striped skirt, and a Tyrolese hat with ribbons. In spite of the chorus in the other room, she was singing some servant's hall song in a rather husky contralto, to the accompaniment of the organ. "'Come, that's enough,' Svidrigailov stopped her at Raskolnikov's entrance. The girl at once broke off and stood waiting respectfully. She had sung her guttural rhymes, too, with a serious and respectful expression in her face. "'Hey, Philippe, a glass!' shouted Svidrigailov. "'I won't drink anything,' said Raskolnikov. "'As you like, I didn't mean it for you. Drink, Katya. I don't want anything more today. You can go.' He poured her out a full glass and laid down a yellow note. Katya drank off her glass of wine, as women do, without putting it down, in twenty gulps, took the note and kissed Svidrigailov's hand, which he allowed quite seriously. She went out of the room and the boy trailed after her with the organ. Both had been brought in from the street. Svidrigailov had not been a week in Petersburg, but everything about him was already, so to speak, on a patriarchal footing. The waiter, Philippe, was by now an old friend and very obsequious. The door leading to the saloon had a lock on it. Svidrigailov was at home in this room, and perhaps spent whole days in it. The tavern was dirty and wretched, not even second-rate. "'I was going to see you and looking for you,' Raskolnikov began. "'But I don't know what made me turn from the haymarket into the ex-prospect just now. I never take this turning. I turn to the right from the haymarket. And this isn't the way to you. I simply turned and here you are. It is strange. Why don't you say at once, it's a miracle? Because it may be only chance. Oh, that's the way with all you folk, laughed Svidrigailov. You won't admit it, even if you do inwardly believe it a miracle. Here you say that it may be only a chance. And what cowards they all are here, about having an opinion of their own, you can't fancy, Rodion Romanovich. I don't mean you. You have an opinion of your own and are not afraid to have it. 
That's how it was you attracted my curiosity." Nothing else? Well, that's enough, you know. Svidrigailov was obviously exhilarated, but only slightly so. He had not had more than a half-glass of wine. I fancy you came to see me before you knew that I was capable of having what you call an opinion of my own," observed Raskolnikov. Oh, well, it was a different matter. Everyone has his own plans. And, apropos of the miracle, let me tell you that I think you have been asleep for the last two or three days. I told you of this tavern myself. There is no miracle in your coming straight here. I explained the way myself, told you where it was, and the hours you could find me here. Do you remember?" "'I don't remember,' answered Raskolnikov with surprise. "'I believe you. I told you twice. The address has been stamped mechanically on your memory. You turned this way mechanically, and yet precisely according to the direction, though you were not aware of it. When I told you then, I hardly hoped you understood me. You give yourself away too much, Rodion Romanovich. And another thing. I'm convinced there are lots of people in Petersburg who talk to themselves as they walk. This is a town of crazy people. If only we had scientific men, doctors, lawyers, and philosophers, might make most valuable investigations in Petersburg, each in his own line. There are few places where there are so many gloomy, strong, and queer influences on the soul of man as in Petersburg. The mere influences of climate mean so much and it's the administrative center of all Russia, and its character must be reflected on the whole country. But that's neither here nor there now. The point is that I have several times watched you. You walk out of your house, holding your head high. Twenty paces from home you let it sink and fold your hands behind your back. You look and evidently see nothing before nor beside you. At last you begin moving your lips and talking to yourself and sometimes you wave one hand and declaim, and at last stand still in the middle of the road. That's not at all the thing. Someone may be watching you besides me, and it won't do you any good. It's nothing really to do with me, and I can't cure you of it, but, of course, you understand me." "'Do you know that I am being followed?' asked Raskolnikov, looking inquisitively at him. "'No, I know nothing about it.' said Svidrigailov, seeming surprised. "'Well, then, let us leave me alone,' Raskolnikov muttered, frowning. "'Very good. Let us leave you alone.' "'You had better tell me, if you come here to drink, and directed me twice to come here to you, why did you hide, and try to get away just now when I looked at the window from the street? I saw it. Ha <laughs> ha! And why was it you lay on your sofa with closed eyes and pretended to be asleep? though you were wide awake while I stood in your doorway. I saw it." I may have had reasons. You know that yourself. And I may have had my reasons, though you don't know them." Raskolnikov dropped his right elbow on the table, leaned his chin in the fingers of his right hand, and stared intently at Svidrigailov. For a full minute he scrutinized his face, which had impressed him before. It was a strange face, like a mask, white and red, with bright red lips, with a flaxen beard and still thick flaxen hair. His eyes were somehow too blue, and their expression somehow too heavy and fixed. There was something awfully unpleasant in that handsome face, which looked so wonderfully young for his age. Svidrigailov was smartly dressed in light summer clothes, and was particularly dainty in his linen. He wore a huge ring with a precious stone in it. "'Have I got to bother myself about you two now?' said Raskolnikov suddenly, coming with nervous impatience straight to the point. "'Even though perhaps you are the most dangerous man if you care to injure me, I don't want to put myself out any more. I will show you at once that I don't prize myself as you probably think I do. I've come to tell you at once that if you keep to your former intentions with regard to my sister, and if you think to derive any benefit in that direction from what has been discovered of late, I will kill you before you get me locked up. You can reckon on my word. You know that I can keep it. And in the second place, if you want to tell me anything, for I keep fancying all this time that you have something to tell me, make haste and tell it, for time is precious and very likely it will soon be too late." "'Why in such haste?' 
asked Svidrigailov, looking at him curiously. "'Everyone has his plans,' Raskolnikov answered gloomily and impatiently. "'You urged me yourself to frankness just now, and at the first question you refused to answer,' Svidrigailov observed with a smile. "'You keep fancying that I have aims of my own, and so you look at me with suspicion. Of course, it's perfectly natural in your position. But though I should like to be friends with you, I shan't trouble myself to convince you of the contrary. The game isn't worth the candle, and I wasn't intending to talk to you about anything special." "'What do you want me for, then? It was you who came hanging about me. Why, simply as an interesting subject for observation. I like the fantastic nature of your position. That's what it was. Besides, you are the brother of a person who greatly interested me, and from that person I had in the past heard a very great deal about you, from which I gathered that you had a great influence over her. Isn't that enough? Ha, ha, ha! Still, I must admit that your question is rather complex and is difficult for me to answer. Here you, for instance, have come to me not only for a definite object, but for the sake of hearing something new. Isn't that so? Isn't that so?" persisted Svidrigailov with a sly smile. Well, can't you fancy then that I too, on my way here in the train, was reckoning on you, on your telling me something new, and on my making some profit out of you? You see what rich men we are! What profit could you make? How can I tell you? How do I know? You see in what a tavern I spend all my time, and it's my enjoyment. That's to say, it's no great enjoyment, but one must sit somewhere. That poor Katya now, you saw her? If only I had been a glutton now, a club gourmand, but, you see, I can eat this." He pointed to a little table in the corner where the remnants of a terrible-looking beefsteak and potatoes lay on a tin dish. "'Have you dined, by the way? I've had something and want nothing more. I don't drink, for instance, at all. Except for champagne, I never touch anything, and not more than a glass of that all the evening, and even that is enough to make my head ache. I ordered it just now to wind myself up, for I am just going off somewhere, and you see me in a peculiar state of mind. That was why I hid myself just now like a schoolboy, for I was afraid you would hinder me. But I believe," he pulled out his watch, I can spend an hour with you. It's half past four now. If only I'd been something, a landowner, a father, a cavalry officer, a photographer, a journalist. I am nothing, no specialty and sometimes I am positively bored. I really thought you would tell me something new. But what are you, and why have you come here? What am I? You know, a gentleman. I served for two years in the cavalry. Then I knocked about here in Petersburg. Then I married Marfa Petrovna and lived in the country. There, you have my biography. You are a gambler, I believe? No, a poor sort of gambler. A card-sharper, not a gambler. You have been a card-sharper, then. Yes, I've been a card-sharper, too. Didn't you get thrashed sometimes? It did happen. Why? Why, you might have challenged them. Altogether, it must have been lively. I won't contradict you. And besides, I am no hand at philosophy. I confess that I hastened here for the sake of the women. As soon as you buried Marfa Petrovna? Quite so," Svidrigailov smiled with engaging candor. What of it? You seem to find something wrong in my speaking like that about women. You ask whether I find anything wrong in vice? Vice? Oh, that's what you are after. But I'll answer you in order. First about women in general. You know I am fond of talking. Tell me, what should I restrain myself for? Why should I give up women, since I have a passion for them? It's an occupation, anyway." So you hope for nothing here but vice? Oh, very well, for vice, then. You insist on its being vice. But anyway, I'd like a direct question. In this vice, at least, there is something permanent, founded indeed upon nature and not dependent on fantasy, something present in the blood like an ever-burning ember, forever setting one on fire, and, maybe, not to be quickly extinguished, even with years. You'll agree, it's an occupation of a sort. That's nothing to rejoice at. 
It's a disease, and a dangerous one." Oh, that's what you think, is it? I agree, that it is a disease like everything that exceeds moderation. And, of course, in this one must exceed moderation. But in the first place, everybody does so in one way or another, and in the second place, of course, one ought to be moderate and prudent, however mean it may be. But what am I to do? If I hadn't this, I might have to shoot myself. I am ready to admit that a decent man ought to put up with being bored, but yet... And could you shoot yourself? Oh, come! Svidrigailov parried with disgust. Please, don't speak of it! He added hurriedly, and with none of the bragging tone he had shown in all the previous conversation. His face quite changed. I admit it's an unpardonable weakness, but I can't help it. I am afraid of death, and I dislike its being talked of. Do you know that I am to a certain extent a mystic? Ah, the apparitions of Marfa Petrovna! Do they still go on visiting you? Oh, don't talk of them. There have been no more in Petersburg, confound them!" he cried with an air of irritation. Let's rather talk of that. Though, hm, I have not much time and can't stay long with you, it's a pity. I should have found plenty to tell you. What's your engagement? A woman? Yes, a woman, a casual incident. No, that's not what I want to talk of. And the hideousness, the filthiness of all your surroundings, doesn't that affect you? Have you lost the strength to stop yourself? And do you pretend to strength, too? <laughs> you surprise me just now, Rodion Romanovich, though I knew beforehand it would be so. You preach to me about vice and aesthetics. You, a Schiller. You, an idealist. Of course, that's all as it should be, and it would be surprising if it were not so. Yet it is strange in reality. Ah, uh, what a pity I have no time, for you're a most interesting type. And, by the way, are you fond of Schiller? I am awfully fond of him." But what a braggart you are, Raskolnikov said with some disgust. Upon my word, I am not," answered Svidrigailov, laughing. However, I won't dispute it. Let me be a braggart. Why not brag, if it hurts no one? I spent seven years in the country with Marfa Petrovna, so now when I come across an intelligent person like you, intelligent and highly interesting, I am simply glad to talk, and besides, I have drunk that half-glass of champagne and it's gone to my head a little. And besides, there's a certain fact that has wound me up tremendously. But about that I will keep quiet." "'Where are you off to?' he asked in alarm. Raskolnikov had begun getting up. He felt oppressed and stifled, and, as it were, ill at ease at having come here. He felt convinced that Svidrigailov was the most worthless scoundrel on the face of the earth. "'Ah, sit down, stay a little,' Svidrigailov begged. Let them bring you some tea, anyway. Stay a little. I won't talk nonsense, about myself, I mean. I'll tell you something. If you like, I'll tell you how a woman tried to save me, as you would call it. It will be an answer to your first question, indeed, for the woman was your sister. May I tell you? It will help to spend the time. Tell me. But I trust that you— Oh, don't be uneasy. Besides— even in a worthless low fellow like me, Avadotya Romanovna can only excite the deepest respect. End of Part 6, Chapter 3